Hello, this is Dr. Helen Weatherly. Welcome to our Gender GP podcast, where we will be discussing some of the issues affecting the trans and non-binary community in the world today, together with my co-host, Marianne Oakes, a trans woman herself and our head of therapies. Okay, welcome everybody to another edition of our podcast. I'm Dr. Helen Webley here with Marianne Oakes and uh, another really, 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 really exciting guest with us today. This guest caught our eye back in August um, 2020 when she wrote a, a lovely account of her work as a nurse in her hospital. And I'm not going to say anything more about it because I reckon she's going to tell us um, a load more that, that's going to be really exciting. So really, really, really love to have you, Holly. Holly Lorca, uh, I'm going to hand over to you now just for you to say hello and who you are and what you do and fill us with, with lots of lovely stories. <laughs> so hi, I'm Holly Lorca. I live in Austin, Texas in the U.S. I am a nurse in a very small hospital here in Austin, and I work in the ICU to help recover patients after their bottom surgery. Um, the final surgery in their gender transitions, gender confirmation surgeries. So my specialty is phalloplasty, which is uh, bottom surgery for female to males, where we make a phallus um, using either part of the arm or part of the leg, sometimes part of the the lat muscle here. So I work with them in the ICU and uh, they're here in the hospital for five or six days before they uh, go home and get to get on with the rest of their lives. I fell into this. I was an open heart nurse. I worked recovering patients after open heart surgery for 20 something years. And uh, four years ago, this program came to my hospital. And uh, so I was lucky enough to just be here. And I like to say it fell in my lap as these things do. I don't know, but I've gotten to know the team really well. They're just a great group of folks who just want to help trans people uh, to feel whole and be able to live their lives as the people that they really are. Um, it's a gift. I feel like I fell into this. Um, I myself am genderqueer. I don't like to label myself as non-binary or I would like to think hybrid is a good label for me. I probably, if this surgery was available 20 years ago, I would probably have it, but I know too much mm -hmm. about a surgery. And I also know too much about myself now like I like who I am now I've I've grown into it and so I had top surgery about two years ago it was the best thing I ever did I dabbled in hormones I tried tea for just a little bit but I didn't like how it made me feel so I'm settling here kind of in the middle but what a gift to be able to work with these folks after me myself going through this and feeling alone for most of my life to get to meet this huge population of folks with whom I have so much in common and to get to kind of laugh and cry and tell stories um, while I help them recover from bottom surgery, which is difficult. It's a really difficult surgery. Um, it's very painful. It's uh, emotionally wrought. People have to lie in bed for days and days. So I feel like my presence there uh, makes them feel like they have an ally during this really difficult procedure. And then I've stayed friends with a lot of them after surgery. So I get to hear more about their stories and how they've done with their, their kind of new and appropriate parts in the world. So that's what I do. And then I write silly stories too. Um, I wrote the story for HuffPost. I've written a book that comes out next month. I can't believe this gets to be my life to use all these things that have caused me shame or uh, to feel like I was a monster or would not get loved or be able to love in the way that I wanted to. And it's all come together in this very serendipitous, magical mix of uh, this gets to me, be my big cartoon life now. And uh, I dig it. And now I get to be on things like this podcast with y'all and reach people across the pond. It's all very exciting to me. Wow. Well, well, I don't know. I'm brimming with excitement about what to, um, to talk about. But actually, I'm going to be really fair because I know Marianne will be too. And I always do lots of talking. Marianne. What would what would you like to say? It's where it's where to start. This song. I know absolutely. The first question when I realised you were doing this podcast was in my mind was what's it like being trans in Austin? You know, I know that in the, in the UK we've got you know um, a social climate that's not the always the easiest to navigate if you're trans, and I just wondered you know, a hospital in Austin of all places, and why Austin? Is it a very liberal? town or 
what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Austin is a very liberal town. However, this very liberal, liberal town exists in a very conservative state, unfortunately. So Austin in and of itself is great. And I believe trans folks are okay here in Austin, but you know, our governor, am I allowed to curse on this program? <laughs> he's an asshole and he's bigoted and um a few years ago we had the trans bat he tried to pass the trans bathroom bill i don't know if you all have those in in the uk and just from my personal standpoint i you know i've always been looked at funny in the women's bathroom until i speak you know and then they realize oh i'm actually a girl but suddenly the looks that i was getting in, in bathrooms weren't just confusion uh, you know, people checking the sign on the door to make sure they were in the right one. Suddenly I was getting hatred, you know, looks of people actually hating me. Um, I've been called out in bathrooms now. People have been very vocal about it, like, hey, you're in the wrong one. And they get very upset um, instead of just, you know, asking me. So I think that, you know, a few years ago, it might have actually been easier. And now there's so much uprising against anything that's other than people, you know, uh, they've tried to marginalize folks and and you know make people afraid of anyone who's genderqueer and i think that they're being more vocal about that whereas before they just didn't understand and now they're polarizing folks against the trans community and that's unfortunate but i think that there's also the normalization of it as well because now we're having stories like mine appeared in HuffPost, and i got a lot of hate mail from the huff post you know they had to to take it down the comment section but people are seeing it. I want to keep driving this conversation. There are a lot of people in Austin that want to keep driving this conversation. We had a trans person run for Chamber of Commerce, um, I believe, and, and she didn't win. But it's starting, you know, and even in Texas, it's starting. And that makes me happy. That's why we have to keep doing this stuff. Yeah, I, I so agree with you, Holly. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm not trans, but working with trans people makes me experience some of the hatred that you've just described. And, you know, I don't understand it. And we, we, Marianne and I have said this so many times on this podcast. We don't understand why there's a small proportion of people who have such hatred in their heart. But actually, interesting, I was talking to Charlie Craggs recently. She's, um, she's a, a prominent trans um, activist in, a, in the UK and she was saying Helen we're never going to be able to change that that small percentage there the ones that want to do the hate the ones they want to feel that way they want to believe that way she said we need to be doing this work exactly how you just described it Holly you know raising the bar raising awareness um, showing people because there's a whole middle ground of people who are like I don't know I don't know anything about it so inform me and that's why you do and having people like you in on Huffington Post whether they had to turn comments off or not I think is so important um, um, for that so uh, you know well done and and you know welcome welcome to the team it's it's, um, it's amazing and um, moving on to, to much happier things um, uh, I didn't know we were going to talk about your identity but you brought it up so I'm going to ask you about it if you don't okay. mind. I don't <laughs> Interestingly, just today, the team at Gender GP were talking about non, um, some, uh, one of the people that had come through with, who was non-binary, was, with, who had shared their story. And so many of us said, we don't really understand it fully. It, it's, it's sometimes it's quite tricky to understand that, that, as you called it, the hybrid or in the middle. Um, you know, with the, some of the times it's different pronouns and sometimes, you know, like you said, he's had top surgery, but then the T didn't suit. And that middle ground is quite confusing, I think, sometimes for, for people who haven't experienced anyone like that before, if, I'm, if I may. So I'm really, really interested in your thoughts on that, if you want to, to share, because I know Marianne and I learn every day from the people that we listen to. So the people listening to this would, would I'm sure, uh, would help them to understand. So I think that the most important thing to understand is that we're all on our own journeys with gender, with identity, you know, in general, um, gender or non, like our lives are completely transforming all the time. We're figuring out more about who we are. And I think that, um, you know, with the insurgence of trans people um, being visible, that there has become like, well, okay, so if you're not comfortable being female, then you must want to be male. And I really feel like that's not at all who I am now. Like I have grown to dig my feminine side. You know, I don't want to like grow my hair out and curl it and all that stuff. But, you know, there are parts of me that are feminine. Um, and I don't want to get rid of those. Like I don't want to masculinize my voice. I don't want a big, you know, 
muscular body. I'm very happy where I am. And I don't really know how to explain it any more than I'm glad I, I waited. I'm glad that these options weren't available to me when I was young because I've gotten a chance to enjoy kind of being both. My therapist works with me a lot on getting rid of um, either or mentality and, and, you know, embracing both and mentality in everything in my life. And I feel like for me, the male and the female go together within me, you know, like I have a nickname, Steve. And when I fix something at, at home or if I, you know, have a good day at the gym, I might be Steve that day. I don't know. It, it's just a nickname, but I like having that. I like having the choice and I don't want to disappear into a male identity. I don't, I like being in the middle. I like making people scratch their heads. I like driving this conversation. I feel like this is what I've been put here to do. And I don't want to just pass as being male. Nothing against our, our male folks. Uh, it's just not me. It doesn't feel right to me. So I guess that's the only way I can explain is that it doesn't, it doesn't feel right within me to jump all the way over. Um, nor does it feel right for me to stay in, you know, feminineville and keep my breasts and my body, which I hated. But like having top surgery cured most of my body dysphoria. You know, the fact that I can go to Nordstrom and buy a really nice tight shirt and walk around in it. And even though people stare now or when I go to the, the pool and I don't wear a shirt and people stare, I, I'm so much more comfortable having them stare at me for that than if they were to stare at me for any other reason. So I've just found a comfort level here and it may change. That's another thing I've learned is my feelings might change. You know, I'm real happy that I tried tea because I feel like that was a really good litmus for me to decide, you know, I don't want to, this is not who I want to be. You know, my voice dropped just a little bit. My libido increased. I got a lot more aggressive and I know that those things kind of dissipate when you get through them, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to mess around with those things at all. It wasn't comfortable for me. I think uh, Helen will agree with me. A lot of our patients, we take the approach that sometimes we've got to try hormones to know whether they're right for us. I don't think you can ever know without trying. And some, for some patients, it might be that it's right, but it's not the right time. And like I say, we can change as we get older, you know, this idea that gender's fixed is as crazy as to suggest that it's binary, all unique. And I have the idea of exploration that we probably never get to the end of. It just keeps evolving as we grow. Uh, I agree completely with that. And um, that was a, a big day for me was to embrace the fact that this is a journey. This is, there's no end point to this. And to allow myself to be open to the possibility of changing my mind or of, you know, things changing for me. And that was very freeing. You know, you spend so much of your life and I don't know if, you, if your experience was this, but you know, you, you, you go to bed at night and you pray when you're a child that you'll wake up as the right thing. And, you know, you'll just, you're just hoping, hoping that you can be okay, hoping that you can uh, be the way that you want to be. But do we ever really know the end point of who we want to be? And I think this is a great point. Um, but I think it's, it's a scary point because then I don't want people to use this as the argument as we should make children wait mm. until, you know, we start hormones or hormone blockers or schedule surgeries. Because I think for some kids, they know 100% that they want to be male or they want to be female. And we should move 100% in that direction rapidly with, with these people. So I think it's just, it's a careful it's a careful conversation to have. And I'm always very wary about having it because I don't want to sway people from allowing children to do what they need to do. But actually, isn't it that um, the important thing is that explore, exploration and that journey. And the message is, you know, if you want to try the different hormone, the other hormone to the one that your body produces, we'll try it. But if you don't like it, if it's not for you, we'll stop it again. And then we'll see what, see what the birth hormone feels like again. And then if in, in six months, a year, two years, 10 years, you want to try it again, there's no problem with that. And I think the things that you have said, um, Holly, in the last 10 minutes or so, are things like feeling comfortable, feeling happy. And it doesn't matter whether you're cis or trans or a hybrid or something in the middle or whatever. Isn't that what we all want to do? We want to feel comfortable in our hearts, in our families, in our bodies, in our loving relationships. And we want to be happy. That's just what we all want to do. 
never mind. And actually, we try loads of different things, don't we, to, to make ourselves happy, youngsters and, and older people, to, um, to make ourselves happy. And that's just everybody. Yeah, I think that maybe if we could uh, destigmatize or, you know, more normalize the fact that we're just like, it's not that big a deal. We're just trying to feel happy. We're just trying to find out what makes us feel good, just like everybody else is with everything. I think that's a really good way to look at this. And it, you know, it doesn't have to have anything to do with the Bible, y'all. <laughs> Absolutely. There's so many different influences, aren't there, Marianne? I, I was going to say, um, I do relate to that, you know, going to bed at night, uh, praying that something would happen and we would wake up different. And that's a story that I hear all the time from lots of... Universal, 100%. Uh, across all generations. One of the things, and I was, I was just listening to you and it just brought it to my mind. For anyone that's not questioning their agenda, they can get up in the morning, they can go to the wardrobe, they can pick a jumper or something that's going to make them feel good about themselves that day without thinking about the gender. Mm -hmm. For people who are questioning the gender to whatever degree, we go to that wardrobe and it's a battle and, and we're pulling on a costume to get us through the day and survive the day. We're not just being, and, and I think listening to you describe, I'm imagining that whether it's Steve's side of the wardrobe or Holly's side, it doesn't matter. You just have the wardrobe and, and it'll be mm -hmm. what it is that day. And actually, isn't that just a privilege that we should all be able to experience? Yeah, the fact that we even have to talk about it as it being, you know, something. Yeah, just buy whatever clothes you want. Put on whatever you want all the time. I've got a theory, I have to say, and I'm probably wrong and we'll get shouted at when some people listen to this, but, I, you know, I genuinely think there are people out there that are jealous that some people are comfortable enough to have explored and got to that place where they're not wearing that facade. And because, you know, the, a lot of the people around us are wearing a facade of some kind. And I do, you know, there is just a little part of me thinks, you yeah, know, why would you hate? Why is there so much bile in your tone? And I can only imagine it's coming from a place, of, I don't know, jealousy, envy. If you're strong enough to do these things, I mean, imagine the other things that we've all had to deal with and thought about and handled, you know, like this is the big major one. But I mean, I feel so free in, in all of my life now to be who I am, you know, that I can just get up on HuffPost and write this thing and, you know, have my name attached to it. And I don't give a shit. Like this is, I've already done the hardest thing that I could possibly do, you know, which is look at this. The rest of the stuff is not that, it's not that hard. So, and, and, and again, both of you there have mentioned that word bravery, isn't it? And, you know, it, it, it is very brave. And we, we see that a lot from people who come to Gender GP when they're, thinking about taking some steps to change their life in some way, change their social interactions, change their external presentation, change their internal chemistry. Those are very brave steps to take. So, you know, and, and both you have there separately have mentioned that brave word. And, and fighting to be happy or fighting to be accepted, fighting to feel comfortable, um, even uh, in the face of adversity is brave. Um, and, you know, we, we, we have to recognize that. So, so hats off and, uh, and high five to all those people who've been brave enough to step forward to find that comfort um, in the face of difficulty. But Holly, so I want to just um, say to you, because you, you've, again, you've both talked about the, the going to bed and praying that in the morning something will be different. So you indeed in your job get the absolute delight of when somebody wakes up, they have that, um, that their prayer has been answered and they have something different. Um, and, you know, I'm actually, absolutely, actually I've gone goosey all over me and my hair standing on my head <laughs> because just the thought of all those um, people who were assigned female at birth and the amount of times we've heard what did they ask for for Christmas all they want is a willy when is my willy going to grow and you know to be part of that journey of somebody when their willy grows quite quickly <laughs> um, in the course of that operation must be so um, exciting tell us about it <clears throat> oh it really is exciting I have had to so many patients cry you know when I pull the covers because I always say congratulations do you want to see it and I mean it's always yes um, and a lot of the other nurses don't do that. And I always want to say, don't you understand what just happened? Like we just made a willy, you know, whatever. Um, 
but yeah, I always say congratulations and their faces and their whole beings light up and they break down and they've suddenly gotten the one thing that they wanted their entire lives. So then I say, do you want to measure it? And I go and get the tape measure out because uh, who doesn't want to measure their willy? Um, it's really moving. And I try not to let it get lost on me. I try not to let it get old because it's new for each person. Um, like today, um, we're having a vaginoplasty come out of the OR. And so I, I'm in charge today. I'm not taking care of patients, but I'm going to make it a point to go in there and make a big deal out of it because I think sometimes the nurses forget to do that or don't do that. And it's like their birthday, you know, they suddenly get what they want. And I can't believe that I get to be on the end of this. It's just this journey of my life, the way that it's folded upon itself and, you know, come around full circle. Suddenly I get to help people with this and, and be there on the, the first day that they see their new parts is crazy. Yeah, it, I, it's never lost on me. When I read the article, you were talking about it and how you, you, know, you are with the patients. The one thing I can say, and going off my own experience, you know, when we go through this journey, those closest to us are actually in pain. We're going through something, we're gaining something, and they're losing something. Oh, that's, that's the perception. And I can only imagine there's a lot of people waking up from that surgery that have got nobody to high five, nobody to celebrate with. And to have a nurse there that's saying, being congratulatory and, you know, making a big deal of it. I just think that's invaluable. Uh, I'm sure there is a lot of loneliness waking up uh, after the operation. So uh, I, I thought that was fantastic. Thanks. And um, I think that also now with COVID, um, we are allowing visitors on our hospital so people are truly alone um, yeah. when they wake up and they'll be alone their entire hospitalization here. Um, yeah, I feel like I serendipitously get to offer a friendly face, an ally, someone to make them feel safe and seen. And I'm so happy that I get to be the one to be there. I think um, you're, you're so happy. I'm, I'm imagining that there are some patients who are really, really happy to have a nurse like you. Um, you know, I, I'm a doctor, I've worked with lots of nurses, um, and a good doctor or a good nurse is such a valuable commodity, isn't it? And clearly you have so much heart and passion um, for your patients. Well, and I'm stupid too. Like I just crack <laughs> really bad jokes. And I mean, so when, when we first, uh, as a hospital, found out that we we're going to do this, everybody got this real serious, like, oh, this, we need to be very serious and very professional. And, you know, and, you know, three weeks into it, we're all cracking dick jokes. And it's like, I'm ridiculous, but the laughter helps to calm people down and it helps them to feel safe and to not feel afraid. And so I feel like me and my ridiculousness has helped even more with this. I mean, regardless of my gender, uh, queerness, um, you know, my being an ally for them. I'm also ridiculous and funny. And I feel like that just really helps. That's been an invaluable tool uh, in my entire nursing career, but specifically with this, because I can make the jokes that somebody else won't feel comfortable making, but that we get, we gender queer folks get. And um, I just feel like that's just, all of this has been such a gift to me. Yeah, well, your, your patients are very, very lucky to have you, I'm sure. So the, in terms of, um, you know, people, uh, people who are, are still, let's call them people who are still learning about gender and gender affirmation therapy or hormones or surgery, sometimes they will say that that is such a big thing to do to your body. Your body wasn't made that way. Why would you go through that and put yourself in those risks? Um, it's, this is irreversible. So... You've seen lots of people at the other end, and you mentioned that you make, you've often made friends with them and, and kept in touch. You know, how, how many times have you seen regret or oops or I shouldn't have done that? Um, or, or, is that or is the experience different to that? I have seen, the only regret I've seen is that people didn't realize how painful or involved or frustrating the recovery is after this. But I have never heard anyone regret having it done, not even one time, not even when there was a complication, when things didn't go like they thought it was going to go. I 100% of the time have heard that they are very happy that they did it. I think by the time people get to this stage, I mean, they know that they'll have no regrets, which is why they're comfortable doing this. Um, you know, I often say that 
it's such an important surgery that people, that's all they think about. You know, once they find out that this is available, their entire lives become about it. I mean, that's how important it is. So of, of course, they're not going to have regrets. Like they have planned their entire lives to have this, you know? So I always say, I ask people, well, how long have you been, you know, planning this? I mean, and what I always mean is how long have you been trying to schedule it? But it's always however many years they've been alive is the answer to the question. I should not answer that, ask that question anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, so no, no regrets. People know they want this. You know, it's what, it's what makes them correct human beings. I always get the sense, you know, the lives have been leading up to this moment. Uh, you know, if, if by the time you lay on that uh, trolley being wheeled down for surgery, uh, you haven't gone through the process, you can, you know, they'd climb off it. Nobody is going to put themselves <laughs> through that surgery if they're not prepared for it. You just couldn't, right. you're not strapping people to the trolley and forcing them down there, are you? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, we are not. No. Um, you know, this brings up something. Can, can I talk about something different that um, has yeah, surprised me is so being the way that I am, like I wanted a Willie my entire life. Um, like I've struggled with that, whatever. Uh, it's still hard sometimes. But so taking care of the, the phalloplasties, the, the female and male patient, piece of cake for me, right? Get it. I understand. But when I started taking care of the vaginoplasties and find out that they had their willies, you know, not cut off, but changed in the OR, I had to deal with some feelings about that, like to understand that it was as important for that population to take their willies off basically as it was for the other population to get a willy. And that really surprised me. I had to really sit down and think, wow, Holly, you need to understand what's happening here. So that was hugely educational for me. Um, And I learned a whole lot about myself. Now I got it. And now, like, now I would say, what if we could just all change parts, you know? It's the same for me when I'm doing the uh, surgery referrals for top surgery. You know, to hear somebody's utter disgust for the chest, uh, yet my craving, you know, to have a chest, it, it, it does flip everything on its head. The one thing I've learned is that as much as my dysphoria would drive me to want that chest, their dysphoria is driving them to be rid of it. And... The feelings are very similar and the significance of, of a chest or, of, you know, a vagina or a, a penis is massive to a trans person. And uh, you can't, you know, whichever direction you're traveling in, the parallels are there. The, the feelings that drive us to be searching out the surgeries are equal. But yeah, I do sometimes recoil thinking, really? <laughs> you know, but... Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but then, you know, that's what makes us unique. You know, we've got our own journeys to go, our own explorations, and we all go as far or as, uh, not so far as we decide. Right. I think for me, what you, you've been talking about there, Holly, Holly, the, what, the one that you were talking about um, a few minutes ago when, um, you were describing, you know, ad- addressing your own feelings about what the patients wanted. And that's such an important thing, isn't it? For, for any healthcare professional that might be listening to this podcast, you will all have personal feelings and emotions about the patient in front of you, whether they are a heart patient or a trans patient, you're going to have feelings about, about, about it. And it's, Never, never more important than with something like transgender identity, which, which that person might not understand about. But to have a look inside at your own feelings. What are you feeling? What, what are your emotions? And do you need to take some time out to address those so that you can give your patient the best care? And I think that's you know, so important, isn't it? And the other thing is that I wanted to, to say is, let's go back to those assessments, you know. And Marianne, I love your um, imagery of strapping the patient to the trolley as they're being wheeled down to the operating theatre, forcing the Venflon into their arms and give them the anaesthetic and making them have the operation. It's just not like that, is it? Yet we see this, the, the, the kind of the criteria, you must have two extremely detailed letters which must contain this, that and the other. And you have to convince me that this patient wants it. And it's like, hello, why don't you ask the patient? Why don't, you, why don't you, surgeon, why don't you sit down with this patient and ask them how, how long have they been wanting this surgery? Uh, yes, they're sure. They've been thinking about it, as you say, since the minute they knew it was in existence, you know. So these, we've talked, um, Holly, Marianne, Marianne and I are always talking about assessments and, and, and how in many ways degrading they are. But this is another one we haven't talked about, you know, that, that the number of assessments and the detail that people have to go into to convince 
a surgeon to um to 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 do what they that patient is desperate to have done yeah and you know with my top surgery i don't know that my surgeons had performed top surgery on someone who was not transitioning all the way who was not changing you know identity markers uh not changing birth certificate. So um, I think that was a new one for them. I had to have one letter, uh, no big deal. Um, but yeah, I wish we could change that. Like, why do we have to jump through so many hoops? Like, aren't my own feelings enough um, to justify what I want to have done? And if you can't trust me, the patient you're working on to tell you what I want done, like, what are we saying about people's own personal feelings? You know, why, why is a uh, a psychologist or psychiatrist more qualified to tell you how I feel about myself than I am. Those are great questions. Uh, and Marianne, I mean, you're, you're lucky enough that you get, because you have to have these letters, Marianne is really, really lucky because she does the assessments um, for people's. So she gets to talk to the people who are on their way to, to your um, operating theatre. And that's, you know, I feel really lucky for Marianne that she gets that pleasure and privilege, but it's not, not so, so much for the patients, Marianne. <laughs> I was just going to say, a little bit like you, Holly, when they come for an, assess, an, an assessment, a referral letter uh, with me, they, they, this, they're always surprised how I just approach it. It's all about rapport, getting them to talk. It's a conversation. I pick up a feeling from them. And I kind of make it clear, I'm not making this decision. You're going to make this decision. I'm going to support your decision. That's what this conversation is going to be about. And I think, what right does anybody have to tell you that, they know you better than you know yourself. And I, it, I don't know. I, I don't make light of it. The weight of responsibility is on my shoulders. Don't misunderstand. But I do not pass that weight on to them. I try to make it as informal a conversation that they can have. It, it, I just don't... I'm humbled that they have to come to me. And a bit like Helen said, it, yeah, it is a privilege that I have. But it is, it's a privilege I would forfeit to, if the surgeons would just believe them. Well, liabilities and such, right? Lawyers. It's all because of lawyers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, can't, I also have to say, I have a little bit of a um, empathy. You know, if I was a surgeon, I'm going to cut somebody open, uh, you know, do something. There, there is a little part of me thinks, can we be doubly sure, you know, because I'm going to be performing life-changing surgery. So I, I kind of get it, but... I think it's. I think the site. The the certainly in the UK, some of the surgeons are just too, too over the top with that. Mm. Um, and I think it's again, it's the discrepancy between what happens to you if you're a cisgender person wanting chest surgery, or if you're a transgender person wanting chest surgery, and and that inequality is just is just not fair. And what we should be doing, I feel, is spending our time working with that patient on the rest of the journey, the journey after the surgery, how, what do you think it's going to look like? Is your, is your perception of what it's going to look like and you in the world with that change, is it the same as reality or, or, or what us as professionals experience um, of other people who've been through that? Because um, that's the knowledge that we have, um, is, is so many people before, during and after surgery. And I wish that that's the kind of thing that we were able to spend our time doing rather than validating gender uh, again you know to be fair as as well helen we um we know that actually the emotional support is probably more important than the medical support at times and there's so much time and effort put into looking after the medical side of it that a lot of patients haven't got the money then to to support themselves with the emotional side and certainly again in the uk you know, um, the, 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 some of the services that they access that are private are so expensive and it's all about medical treatment that there is, there's very little money left to look after themselves emotionally and that's the shame. And what you said about staying friends with some of the patients, I think that's great uh, because that's the emotional support that they need, isn't it? Well, I don't know how much emotional support I am, again. Uh, <laughs> but... Yeah, I think that all of the the internet, like the groups and the um, the 
that is incredibly helpful. The um, I'm in, I have so many of my patients in message groups, and so they all know that I'm going to be at the other end when they wake up because they've all been, you know, blogging and messaging and whatever. But I think that those things are hugely um, supportive. And yeah, if I can be a part of that, uh, and it, especially if they see me as an ally, like putting things on Huffington Post or writing a book, then I feel like um, it it just helps make the network even bigger for everyone, you know? That's just something, and um, I'm going to go backwards a little bit here, so I apologize, but you said something before, and I recoiled a bit when you said it, because you said when you went for your surgery, that it was an anomaly, that the surgeons weren't used to somebody that wasn't going the full uh, distance or, you know, fully transitioning. And I recall a little bit, because I just think that is full for you, isn't it? That's your journey. And it's interesting how other people see that, but straight away, I was thinking, I was getting protective of you there, saying, but that is your journey, that is full. <laughs> if that's well, where you want to be, then, then there's, no other, there's no continuation to the next station at this moment in time. Uh, you know, it, it was a little strange because um, my friends that I have at work, I've, we've all worked together for a very long time. When the surgery started happening here, all of a sudden they were looking to me and saying, you know, like, when are you having your surgery? And I had to say, like, just stop. And especially after I had my, my top surgery, then they're like, well, when are you scheduling your bottom surgery? Well, let's all take a minute here and maybe we can have a talk about how this actually is versus what you have in your head. This is my thing is I, I can charm people into talking to me or put myself in the right place at the right time to having these conversations. Um, and I really, I feel like it's just my job to help people understand that it's not either or, it's not. You don't have to be one or the other. You, know, you don't have to pick. Um, so even if I can help the surgeons, they're, they're better now. They got it, you know, they're fast learners. Those guys. <laughs> we taught them. We've seen that. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll teach you. If you just have to listen, we'll teach you. Um, uh -huh. Tell us about your book, Holly. What, what, oh, what did you want to write about? Um, I have a book coming out next month called Handsome. Um, I've been writing stories since I was young enough to hold a pencil and a piece of paper. And I finally put enough of these stories together to get a book together. And um, it all kind of came together uh, right around the time when I started helping with these surgeries. And so the last few stories in the book are all about um, my gender journey um, and about how serendipitously it's kind of uh, come to pass here. Um, so they're stories about me just not fitting in the world. I mean, they're, I've been an awkward human my entire life, gender notwithstanding. And so that it's a book about trying to understand my place in the world with no, you know, we don't get a map. We don't get a, an instruction manual. And I grew up in the seventies. So there weren't really even any talks about g being gender queer, having gender issues. So they're just stories of me trying to figure out where I fit in and how I fit in. Um, and they're geared. I, I wanted to reach an audience that was not LGBTQ um, a, I just, I wanted it to be for the general public. I kind of charm people in by putting a few funny stories up front before I start to launch into more of the serious stuff. And um, because I want people to know me as an entire human being, it's not just my gender struggles that make me who I am. So that is my book. Um, you know, it's my voice is strong and um, I talk about sex a lot. I feel like it's important for us to be honest about sex. I talk about how we all learned about sex by reading like Fifty Shades of Grey or Judy Bloom or um, and things that weren't correct, you know, romance novels. Those aren't actual stories about what it's like to discover your sex and your sexuality. Um, it's mostly awkward fumbling, feeling that you're you're gross or you're you're not right. Um, you know, even cis folks. Um, so I feel like it's just an honest discussion about who, who I am in the world. And people have told me that they can relate to it because it makes them feel uh, not alone, um, that like sh everyone experiences shame, self-loathing. And so it's the story of how I came to love myself kind of handling all of this. Um, I feel like it's really timely right now. It just is coming out at, at just the right time. Um, so I'm really hopeful that it will drive this discussion of, of gender, of that it's not, 
you know, black and white. There are all kinds of stories in the middle. And also it's not scary. Um, you know, if it doesn't have to be scary to the general public. We're all just folks who perhaps suffered a birth defect. I don't know what everyone else's thoughts are on that, but um, I think my hormones got messed up, you know, and so my biological presentation is not what it was supposed to have been. Or is it? I don't know. I mean, was this program from the beginning for this to be my struggle to have these conversations and write a book, um, all of these questions. But I, I just want to, you know, let's just normalize this. There's, this is just a thing that happens. You know, it's just a thing that happens that we're all trying to handle and it doesn't need to be scary or polarizing um, or against religion or, I mean, who thought that one up anyway? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I, I, I'm very excited about reading your book, and certainly we will put a link underneath um, the podcast and to help, Thank you. to help anybody who would love to learn, and that's what it's about. And, and I love the, the idea of just normalising this. Um, I don't like the word defect because I don't see you, what I'm looking at here, a lovely image in front of me that's defective in any way. But I'm quite liking the, the idea that maybe, you know, this was the resin detra, this was for you to maybe help people. Um, and that's what medic healthcare professionals are here to do. You know, that's our vocation. So if your gender has helped you as a nurse in your profession, um, and in your and as your book and your writing as well. If 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 you were put here to do that, then it sounds to me like you've done a really amazing job. Trying, trying. You know, I feel like I've been given this great bag of beautiful things. And I'm just trying to make the best of it right now. I'm just trying to maximize what I can do, and uh, it makes me feel so good to feel like I've reached people. And when um, I'm I'm having some advanced copies come back with reviews right now, and and it's always the same thing. I would never have picked this book up. Um, it's not something that I would gravitate toward reading, but God, I'm really glad I did because now I, I kind of understand a little bit more about what this is about. And that by far is the best response that I could ever get. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you um, personally from myself, from Marianne, from anybody listening here. Thank you so much for joining us from all the way over in Texas. Um, it sounds like you've had an amazing career and, you know, thank you for sharing your, your own journey and, and those that you've, you've helped um, with us today. Um, and really, you know, all the best for everything that you do. Um, and thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, I really appreciate the work that you all are doing as well. And I will continue to watch and listen to you guys over there across the pond. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go see about a new vagina. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely to be with you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed our program today. Please go ahead and subscribe to future episodes if you haven't done so already. If you or anyone else have been affected by any of the things that we've talked about in our podcast today and you'd like to contact us, please visit our website, Help Centre, and contact us via there. We are very happy to accept ideas for future episodes and future guests, so let us know if there's anything specific you'd like us to cover. You can also visit our website, gendergp.com, for a multitude of information about transgender health and wellbeing issues. You can follow us on social media. ID is at gendergp. And you can sign up to our monthly newsletter. Full details can be found in our show notes on our podcast page. Thanks for listening and see you soon.